Welcome to this Time Stackies webinar. I am Sujit John, and I have with me my colleague Shilpa Fadnis. The two of us will moderate the discussion. We hope you and your families are staying safe and doing well. Our discussion today is in association with Akamai Technologies. I had always known Akamai as a content delivery network, having these edge servers that would accelerate data flows. But Akamai is also now a major cybersecurity and cloud service company. And today's discussion will focus on cybersecurity and in particular on ransomware attacks. Ransomware attacks are rising every day as the number of people using online systems keeps increasing due to the digitization and hybrid work culture. The threat will only grow as criminals are inventing new ways to gain access to networks and systems. The attack surface is also growing with continued work from home and the rise in internet enabled devices. Akamai's recent acquisition of Guadicore enables it to offer micro segmentation solutions. These solutions are designed to limit user access to only those applications that are authorized to communicate with each other. To talk about all this and more, we have three very seasoned professionals with us today. We have with us Mitesh Jain. Mitesh is country manager for the India region at Akamai Technologies. He's responsible for accelerating growth of the business in India and SaaS countries. Mitesh has a sales career spanning over 18 years. He has worked with companies including Oracle, Microfocus, Ubex, and Adobe, driving enterprise account strategies, as well as helping orchestrate business transformation for organizations across industry segments. Welcome, Mitesh. Thanks, Sujit. We have with us Rama Vidashri. Rama is the CEO of Data Security Council of India. DSCI is pursuing a cybersecurity industry growth charter to make India a global hub for cybersecurity. Prior to DSCI, Rama was vice president at NASCOM, leading all initiatives in domestic IT, e-governance, and smart cities. At NASCOM, she's also led the healthcare initiative. Rama also has had long stints at NIT Technologies, Microsoft, and General Electric. Welcome, Rama. And we have with us Ariel Zetlin. Ariel is VP and CTO of the Enterprise Security Group at Akamai Technologies. Ariel co-founded Wadicor with uh, which uh, Akamai acquired last year. Prior to that, he spent 11 years as an officer in the Israeli Defense Forces, where he worked closely with Wadikor's co-founder, Pavel Gurvich. He's based in Israel and speaking to us from Tel Aviv. Welcome, Ariel. Thank you. Those of you who are in this can send in questions through the Facebook comment box. Sujit and I will put them to Mitesh, Rama, and Ariel. Uh, coming to you, Mitesh and Rama first, what is the current landscape uh, of ransomware in India? Sure, um, I can go first. Um, so first of all, thanks for the brief introduction, uh, Sujit and Shilpa. I'm uh, once again, super excited to be here today. Uh, been at Akhmai for a little over nine years now. And in my current role as the country sales director in India, I lead our go-to-market teams where I get an opportunity to collaborate with a lot of our customers across wide verticals, helping them to leverage the power of Akhmai and uh, be unstoppable with uh, world's largest and most trusted edge platform. Uh, now, coming to your question on ransomware landscape, uh, you know, ransomware wants simply a piece of malicious software that takes over computer systems, denying user access to data, uh, which was used by cyber criminals to really demand ransom in exchange to, you know, restore access to that data, has now really morphed into an attack method of uh, epic proportions. And you know, while the threat of permanent data lo loss alone is disturbing, uh, cyber criminals have become more sophisticated to use ransomware to uh, penetrate and really cripple large enterprises, governments, and all honesty, enterprises of all sizes. And yes, much to our disliking, uh, ransomware attacks are increasing in numbers and intensity every passing year. So it's a huge problem for enterprises around the world with new attacks striking every 11 seconds. And the damages resulting from ransomware is expected to amount to over $20 billion globally just last year alone. Now coming to India, Indian enterprises have been facing a growing number of ransomware attacks as the cyber criminals try to compromise their infrastructure you know, almost half of uh, enterprises in India suffered multiple ransomware attacks, while 76% were hit by at least one ransomware attack in the past 12 months. And, uh, you know, many Indian companies even gave in to extortion demands of attackers to avoid an attack. 
So we've been facing a steady increase in cyber attacks and breaches uh, since the onset of pandemic. And the shortage in the cybersecurity talent has only made it worse. So, um, you know, it's a serious problem that can't be overlooked anymore. Rama, you want to add to that? And uh, my, an additional thing, do companies, I mean, they generally, uh, though Mitesh says massive number of these attacks happening, but we don't really hear about so many uh, in the media. I presume a lot of the companies keep it to themselves. Is that true? Not really. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, all companies uh, try to first address the problem, but to add to what, uh, you know, Mitesh articulated, while the rest of the cyber threats, even including, you know, something like the phishing campaigns have continued, you know, particularly in the last two years with the wave of digitization, I think ransomware is a big problem, which started with, you know, the, uh, the first big attack across the world, which was one wanna cry. Whereas in the last couple of years, we've seen maze really create amazing uh, proportion of disruptions across various enterprises and many other ransomware attacks. But I think what is the biggest uh, challenge we as industry, whether it is user enterprises or the security industry is facing is the emergence of ransomware as a service, which is really creating a third party ecosystem of you know, ransomware as a service where the attackers need not have those kind of skill sets and competencies. There is a third party ecosystem to be leveraged to create or, you know, to just launch a ransomware attack. So this ransomware as a service is something is I think beginning to become a big menace at, at a country level and a company level across the world. It's not just in India. So whether it is, uh, certs across various countries, whether it's national security institutions, and of course, our own industry members who are trying to secure networks for our customers worldwide. Now, there is a huge challenge because here we are seeing, you know, the actual attacker does not need to uh, have those kind of competencies. So ransomware as a service is, I think, what is really uh, making this menace of ransomware even more uh, a bigger cyber risk. So that is something that we are seeing. Yes, as Mitesh has artic articulated, ransomware attacks have become more uh, proliferate. If you see the moment at which a particular attack happens in one part of the world, the way it gets launched in other parts of the world, where because the supply chain of in the digital ecosystem, you know, spreads across multiple geographies and multiple customer organizations, the speed at which it happens is worrying every CIO and CISO. And uh, given the way these are attacking, how do you upgrade your enterprise technology infrastructure, people capability is another big challenge. Uh, that doesn't mean the other cyber risks have gone away. They continue to whether it is all the risks around zero day vulnerability, supply chain risks, phishing, some of the risks around uh, migrating to you know legacy systems onto internet platforms or cloud platforms, which uh, took place at a rapid scale in the last two years. All of those continue. It doesn't mean that now a CISO can work with their security providers to mitigate the ransomware risk. They need to look at every other risk, but also give attention to ransomware because it a, creates a lot of, uh, you know, disruption, the kind of scale and, you know, the extortion. Data exfiltration is another one that's a big challenge that, uh, uh, you know, enterprises deal. What, what is that? I mean, in any of these cyber attacks, the way the data gets exfiltrated from your enterprise yeah. networks, based on which criminals try to monetize it and get a ransom out of it. Okay, okay. Yeah, and if I can, uh, if I can just add one last bit to what Rama said, uh, you know, so what we've seen the factors that are attributing to the sudden increase in ransomware attacks are, you know, one of course, as we witnessed a massive surge in adoption of technologies in the wake of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. You know, several companies were forced to shift to a remote or a hybrid working model, uh, increasing their dependence on the online business processes, which made most of these companies an easy target for ransomware attacks, which really uh, resulted in, uh, you know, a greater attack surface for cyber criminals to exploit, you know, remote workers, DDoS attacks targeting VPNs and, and, and the remote access infrastructure. And then the other is uh, cloud migration. Uh, you know, I mentioned about, uh, uh, about skill shortages and really the increased threat activities, you know, which left 
many organizations struggling to keep up with uh, the pace of these uh, security developments. And some of the recent breaches we've seen are classic examples of this. And, and sadly, you know, these threats will only grow as uh, more enterprising cyber criminals, you know, find new ways to take advantage of this uh, you know, ever-growing attack surface. And, and so it's very, very vital for organizations to put in place a strategy for protecting you know, critical assets once those defenses are breached. So apart from ransomware, which are the big ones? What kind of attacks? I think the zero-day vulnerabilities and phishing, particularly last two years with so much of remote workforce, very targeted phishing campaigns, that has been two big menaces, I would say, and zero-day vulnerabilities and uh, supply chain risks. The third one we are seeing, particularly in the IT industry, is the services companies being targeted to actually launch you know, uh, attacks of a larger scale. Because if one services company is breached, uh, it lets you penetrate many other networks of the customer. Yeah, you're, you're talking about IT services companies or? Uh... Any service company. How does that work? Uh, the chain effect you said? What we are saying is that when a services company is targeted, we have seen this even in ports and other critical infrastructure, right? When there was an attack on the Merck systems. So when, if, let us say, one services player is attacked, it is not, the intention is not to target that services company. It is that the intention is to amplify the attack to the entire customer base. So if, let us say even we have seen the Kesaya attack, right? Where we see it's a third party ecosystem, third party product, which is used in a lot of remote infrastructure management. So when that kind of a product and that ecosystem is attacked, it pretty much attacks every other, uh, the customer base where this installation is happening. So we see some of this, but of course ransomware, phishing attacks, those are the ones and supply chain risks is one uh, the third big one okay okay Ariel, i wanted to bring you in here uh, so your micro segmentation solution uh, how exactly does that work yeah sure uh, so i i think that uh, uh, first of all i'll kind of connect to what my colleague said i think ransomware is uh in a way, just a new way to monetize access. So uh, the way ransomware uh, gets to the organizations is all those uh, uh, old tricks uh, that we have seen. It's just a new way for uh, attackers to monetize access. I think what changed a little bit is that uh, you used to be, uh, if you have, you used to be a target if you had very interesting data, like healthcare, financial, and so on. Now it's not that interesting. A school is a target, not because they have data, it's because they need their business to operate and uh, ransomware can uh, exactly attach itself to this, to this point. If a uh, school cannot operate without their systems and they don't have any interesting data that the attackers can sell. So I think what ransomware changed is that everyone became a target of those techniques that were previously targeted to financial institutions or government organizations. And this is why it's so widespread, I think. Uh, I think what uh, micro-segmentation is actually not a new concept. If you look at uh, how ships were built uh, from the 15th century, is that they assume they can hit uh, an iceberg or, uh, or uh, under a rock under the water, and there can be uh, a hole uh, in their uh, perimeter. Uh, and then uh, to make sure that the ship doesn't think they would compartmentalize uh, the structure of the ship. So only one area of the ship will be uh, filled with water. And we see this same type of approach in, in, in very different areas, actually. This is how bulletproof uh, uh, tires are built. It's not, they're not actually bulletproof, they are, I'm gonna say, bullet resilient. Uh, and uh, and uh, micro segmentation takes the same approach to, to networks, uh, which means that uh, you would assume that you're being breached. What you want to do is you want to uh, reduce the blast radius. Uh, you want to make sure that the attacker only uh, 
gets to where his initial uh, foothold brings him to, either through fishing. Uh, uh, so he will stop on the first laptop that uh, uh, click the bite, uh, or and will not be able to propagate further. Or uh, if he is uh, able to get in through the most sophisticated supply chain attack, he will stop on the server that uh, uh, was affected by the supply chain. Uh, and uh, uh, gives control to the security administrators to assume a breach can happen, but really uh, mitigate the impact. Uh, and the way it's, it's done is by breaking down the network into small segments. And the smaller the segment, the, the bigger the resilience. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, micro segmentation is when you get to uh, relatively small segments uh, over it, it can be as small as one server um, so that's in general micro segmentation which is a part of a bigger approach uh, of zero trust uh, that actually uh, in a way uh, doesn't uh, lets you control effectively uh, any access any connection uh, any data point uh, so uh, uh, and this is actually was the you know, idea behind uh, uh, joining forces uh, with Akama behind the acquisition is that we will bring the inside the network micro segmentation technology and join it with Akamai's uh, technology coming from where they're really strong is from the edge, uh, controlling access to the applications, from the users to the applications, from the internet to the applications. And this way to provide the widest sort of zero trust uh, uh, control uh, toolkit to the CISOs. But with microservices and containers and all that, uh, given the easy flows that happen between applications and all of that, uh, you can still segment it, is it? And ensure the attack doesn't go beyond one application or one workload or something? Yeah, absolutely. I think we uh, what, what we've seen in the last two years is that uh, uh, the actual implementation of Innovate or Die uh, businesses that uh, used to have shops needed to go online completely. It's a completely new way of doing business. Uh, uh, businesses need to uh, compete with each other with better offerings. They needed to change the way the infrastructure looks to let their workers connect uh, from their homes. And uh, uh, what innovation brings uh, uh, in most of the cases on the IT side is new technologies, new types of infrastructures. It's much easier to develop uh, and build new things with technologies like containers or in the cloud. Uh, so this uh, we have seen the uh, uh, wide adoption of those in, in our customers. Uh, and uh, uh, what they are facing now is a combination of extended attack surface because they used to have their well, or what they thought is well-protected data center. Now they also have a cloud and it's connected to the data center. Now people are connecting from their homes to the perimeter. So they open the little app. So the, uh, in, 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 from one side, the uh, attack surface grew significantly uh, and very fast uh, over days. Uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, uh, attackers are now targeting everyone and leveraging this attack surface. So when people are looking to protect their uh, infrastructure, they need to address everything and, uh, and uh, they need to address everything faster than they thought. So uh, applications were spun up in the cloud without the security having the convenience of planning it over months. No, they need to deal with the reality. So uh, we of course support all of those, otherwise we'll be out of business. Uh, because this is where the customers internet are. They are interested in protect their very old on-prem bare metal servers, as well as containers in the cloud uh, that are managed by Kubernetes or whatever. Uh, and this is this is how the uh, attack surface attack surface looks like, and this is where customers want to do implement the zero trust. Okay. Okay. Shilpa. Uh, Mitish, with uh, the threat actors becoming sophisticated with each day, how are enterprises protecting themselves and how can a security partner empower them? 
Yeah, so you know, the first step uh, businesses can take to strengthen their uh, cybersecurity posture is to um, really reframe their security strategy to uh, focus on both external and internal attacks. This means you know, moving away from old perimeter-centric approach to uh, security towards a zero trust mo model that focuses on granting the right people the right access at any time, regardless of location. You know, with end users, applications, devices now anywhere, organizations should look towards shifting their security stack uh, right at the edge of the internet, which ensures that attack traffic can be blocked right at the uh, right at its source. Uh, you know, preventing access to uh, its target. Now, to ease the Let's transition, explain zero trust. I've been hearing zero trust a lot lately. So it basically means don't trust anything that uh, comes in till you verify it or something. Is it absolutely right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Now to ease this transition, uh, you know, enterprises can work with cybersecurity provider of their choice that helps to uh, deliver security capabilities from a single platform and is also capable of managing and abstracting the uh, complexities of uh, the distributed uh, infrastructure. Now at Alchemy, we have grown our security portfolio from point solutions into a uh, you know, comprehensive platform which provides defense in tip to address our customers' biggest threats. And um, now by adding Guardicore's micro-segmentation solution into our extensive zero trust security portfolio, we are uniquely suited uh, to provide comprehensive protection to the enterprises defending against all these threat actors and uh, the spread, uh, you know, spread of uh, malware and also ransomware. So micro-segmentation uh, comes in at a point when it, despite all the protections that you have, is there still a breach, but at that yep. point, uh, micro segmentation helps to ensure that the I mean it does it's not widespread. So as, as, absolutely right, so as uh, uh, Ariel also sort of briefly touched upon. So the philosophy is that despite having uh, you know um, all the perimeter defenses, attacks will happen. But when they do happen, uh, are you in a position where you can sort of contain the you know blast radius, uh, the extent of damage that those attacks can potentially do? Okay, Rama, uh, I wanted to, you wanted to say something? Uh, I had a question on uh, talent, but uh, did you no, want to I say something? To, I wanted to, you know, add to what Mitesh and Ariel talked about, because uh, I mean, further to your question, whether it's containerization and whether it's micro segmentation and what is this entire zero trust paradigm? It's all because of the last two years, the entire enterprise networks are truly borderless. It's not a buzzword, right? You cannot really know CIO, CISO can really define what is my enterprise security parameter, a perimeter, sorry, right? Because there's so much that has moved to the cloud, multi-cloud and also have a public cloud. So much is moving to the public cloud. And there's so much that is happening at the end user working from anywhere in a remote infrastructure. So it's extremely important that zero trust as a paradigm needs to be implemented in the enterprise before you choose the technology stack to implement zero trust. First, zero trust is a paradigm in terms of how do you authenticate and authorize your users? How do you, you know, validate every resource access? It's not like the first time you log in. And most importantly here, everything is access and resource access control through digital identity. Whereas when we were working in offices, Maybe, you know, you add this card and when you have, once you have gotten, there is some kind of access that is, and you're logged in onto your network physically, right, from your office. Whereas now everything is digital identity based access. So how do you make sure that you don't trust any access at a resource level, any user, and that paradigm needs to be implemented. That is, you know, what is zero trust? Once that you decide to implement that paradigm, it's not like every organization is ready for a zero trust rollout right now. They need to do an assessment of their readiness for zero trust, right? And then also they need to do it in a phased manner. Maybe it could be certain workloads, it could be certain set of users, it could be certain operations. And then you can say you're ready for a zero trust paradigm. And then what is the technology stack and who's the security provider or a services or a product company? But I think there is no choice. When we started two years back, zero trust was still, you know, at a concept. 
but the way it has got accelerated there are so many enterprises even in india some public sector enterprises in oil and gas in banking sector have gone down this path and getting get up so really yes they, they, they are following this uh, no trust model is they it are, they, i mean some of them have already rolled out whether it is in the it its sector but many others are getting prepared they've done all their assessments some of them need to beef up their current enterprise security posture and preparedness to get ready for zero trust so it is definitely happening in all the large enterprises okay okay ariel when you adopt so many security measures does it slow down the system at all are there techniques to avoid all that so i think that yeah, yeah in general i guess complexity is is uh, one of the biggest problems of security it almost at at uh at any at any level that you look from the amount of tools you need to manage to the amount of signals that you get to the complexity of operations to to deal with something investigate and so on so i think that uh what zero trust uh is as an industry uh i would say effort or adoption makes it, it creates a really standard stack that organizations can uh, uh, align with and it's a good one uh, in fact uh, it's it's almost a, a, I would say a, a new name to a very good long time practices if you look at regulators uh, and specific compliances like PCI it's very very similar to what zero trust talks about and it exists for years so the uh, uh, and so industries are i think this is a good uh move by the industry forced i would say by the pandemics and ransomware in a way to align the stack and uh i think when uh there is sort of a standard of uh how organizations want to protect how they want to uh spend and prioritize their uh uh security uh, uh spending uh the vendors will align and will provide good uh uh integrations within the stack so platforms that cover a lot of the stack will uh will be preferred uh pieces of stack that work together well uh will be preferred because it exactly reduces the complexity uh and uh uh and definitely in, within any specific product uh i think that specifically if you look at micro segmentation the uh this this has became one of the key selection criteria is how easy it will be to implement uh the micro segmentation with this specific product how easy it will be to deploy to maintain to actually do the micro seg segments uh, and this is what people are looking at. Secure, uh, complexity is definitely a uh, major, major concern. Okay. Shilpa? Yeah, if we can also talk about the role and impact of AI, machine learning, and 5G on the security landscape. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can try to start. I think that, uh, again, looking at my uh, sort of a microcosmos of uh, uh, Micro segmentation. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of the security products are adopting uh, AI as a way to deal with exactly this complexity, right? Uh, too much signal. Uh, how do you identify what's good, what's bad? Uh, and in micro segmentation, when the idea is to try and break down your data center into smaller segments, uh, you need to understand your environment really well. You need to understand where are applications, where are users, how they are connected, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Uh, and uh, uh, we invest, invested a lot in, in machine learning and uh, uh, to help customers exactly simplify that process, to identify applications for them, to help them identify the dependencies and help them set the policies, suggest uh, what we think should be based on how other customers are. Uh, probably an exchange application looks the same in many, all of the customers. And uh, so we can come up with, uh, okay, let, 
if you're going to segment your exchange application, let us find it for you. Let us suggest you the right policy. Uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so uh, yes, it, I think AI is uh, touching uh, every uh, single product and security, every single area. And uh, for specifically for uh, 5G, I think it's uh, just another uh, carrier of innovation and change in the infrastructure. Uh, it will allow a lot of new use cases. It will allow uh, 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 organizations innovate uh, faster, which will create for the CISOs new attack surfaces and so on. So I think it will only increase the uh, the need for uh, for uh, further adopting uh, this approach of uh, trusting nothing. Uh, okay. Mitesh, I just wanted to take up on what, what Rama previously said. Uh, uh, Indian enterprises, when you go to sell to them, what is the attitude that you see? Uh, do are they, un, are they do they understand the risks, or are there still a lot of hesitation? Is it an expense for them? Do they see it as an expense? What? Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think we have come a long way. Um, you know, everybody understands the uh, importance of, uh, uh, you know, having the defense in depth, improving the overall security posture. Um, you know, cybersecurity is obviously becoming a severe issue for, well, not just individuals, but also enterprises, even governments. You know, in a world where everything is on the internet, uh, you know, from cute kitten videos to our travel diaries to even our credit card information, you know, ensuring that the data remains safe is one of the biggest challenges uh, of cybersecurity. And of course, the challenges come in many forms, such as uh, we've been talking about ransomware, but then phishing attacks, malware, and many more. Um, so obviously security and compliance are the top challenges enterprise face when uh, you know, moving legacy systems to cloud. And uh, unfortunately, many enterprises are still approaching security with the outdated notion of uh, protected, uh, you know, firewall corporate network. However, that has changed in the last two years. Uh, but this approach is uh, obviously in inconsistent with our cloud first, you know, work from anywhere world, you know, things like public facing applications, virtualized servers, and a mix of on-prem cloud technologies, which traditionally meant a protected perimeter approach to security where, you know, a user or an application is uh, either on the network and trusted or off the network and not you know, leaves organizations extremely vulnerable. Uh, this is both because there is uh, nothing to stop attackers if those defenses fail. And also because it's really hard to uh, put cloud-based applications and infrastructure uh, behind traditional security def defenses and still maintain the performance. I know you briefly touched upon uh, the question around, hey, can we still maintain the performance with all this? And, uh, you know, this complexity will only increase as uh, work from home continues to really blur the lines between personal and professional, home and office. And uh, that's not all, you know, go to market timelines for uh, digitization solutions in India have uh, accelerated due to pandemic, you know, causing a shift towards hybrid work, you know, leaving product teams to, and I hate to say this, uh, to deprioritize security in favor of speed. Now, this is something that malicious actors have been able to exploit leading to uh, you know, a rise in the number of cyber security, security attacks. So it is critical that uh, you know, businesses today realize that cyber security is not a nice to have, but an absolute necessity. Shama, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, Mitesh mentioned this uh, issue of talent, um, not enough talent to uh, secure everything. I mean, what, what, what is the sense you have? Um, and is DSAI doing, doing anything to uh, increase the talent that we have? Yeah, I mean, before I get into the talent, just to add a couple of points to what Mitesh talked about uh, at an India country level, I would say it's a mixed bag. If you look at the large enterprises, particularly the regulated sectors, I think they have significantly stepped up their cyber preparedness because of the regulatory frameworks that are coming up. Of course, IT, ITS sector, because they serve the global markets, their level of maturity is way different. We see banking, telecom, insurance, capital markets because of the SEBI's guidelines. Uh, but if we see other sectors like small and medium, state governments, I think only a handful of state governments in India who are doing so much on digital and government to citizen services have socks. 
So healthcare, I think only a handful of hospitals even have a good established security practices. So there are some sectors where significant investments have to happen. So when we are, are attackers interested in the SME segment? I mean, the, oh, they not? do. I mean, SMBs yeah. because when you say SMBs, it's it's across verticals, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at manufacturing sector. The SMBs are the supply chain of the large OEMs, whether it's in the auto sector, any other manufacturing sector, appliances. Similarly, when you look at SMB, when you see all these B2C platform companies, they're those mega platform companies which are in the e-commerce set, but there's a mushrooming of business to consumer platforms across, you know, whether food aggregators, all of them, right? So there, they are targets of attack, particularly because of the data part, you know, the uh, the way the black marketing of data happens, right? There, there is an interest. In terms of talent, I would say, even if you've read the recent, uh, this month's World Economic Forum uh, risk perceptions uh, report, it's talking about a gap of 3 million uh, workforce in cyber worldwide. So even in India, we have a big uh, talent gap. I would say this talent gap is happening across various segments. One is at the entry level, where mostly the entry level hiring happens in the IT industry. There is a gap there too. But I think most of the gap is happening in the mid level to the senior level and specializations because no longer there is no cybersecurity expert, right? You need specialists. You need specialists in crowd, uh, cloud security. You need specialists in, you know, SOC uh, specialists. You need SOC level three, level four kind of analysts. You need people who are into forensics, very advanced forensics, right? So you need a lot of specialization. I think there, there is a much larger gap. Even when you look at vertical specific, because in oil and gas sector, there is so much convergence happening between ITOT, right? So when you look at SCADA security specialists or operational technologies and industrial control systems, I think there's a much larger gap in the talent pool, even in the mid to senior level, and of course at the entry level. So while there is a broader gap, I think now we need to address the gap at a role specific level, whether it's in forensics, because there's so much of forensic talent requirement to support the law enforcement and state police units because of the cyber crime and the investigation that needs to happen. Similarly, when you look at SOCs, before it was an on-prem SOC, right? Where you were doing a SOC for a customer, whereas now, Socks are for multiple clients, maybe on the cloud. Uh, how do you manage those kind of socks, right? Similarly, so much, so much critical workloads are moving to the cloud. So when you're moving into the cloud, what is that application security? What is the cloud security and governance? So we would say now the time is to go into specialization. We are doing quite a bit on that where we do a lot of sessions and webinars. NASCOM and DSCI are trying to do a lot around future skills and the cybersecurity job roles and what is that. We work very closely with Ministry of uh, Information Technologies uh, and Electronics on the ICIA program, which is Information Security Education Awareness Program. If you just do a dipstick, uh, Sujit, now versus last year, how many engineering colleges have an MTech cyber and a BTech cyber? You will see the number of colleges which are offering that. That means even at an entry level, we are trying to build that specialization. Really? That's very interesting. Yeah, okay. it is huge. It's a huge number of colleges. That is thanks to the ICIA program, which is now in its phase three, which is only focused around cybersecurity capability building in the formal education sector. Uh, so we are seeing that. We are also seeing more and more PhD, uh, pass out PhD you know, disciplines in cyber where across all the premier engineering colleges, a lot of them specializing. There is a talent gap. Next is the CISO at a leadership level, right? Uh, because now more and more sectors are mandating a full-time CISO. Already we have that in across all the large enterprises, right? Where is that CISO leadership talent pool? Because the CISOs are technocrats. They're also the risk leaders. They're uh, accountable to report to the board. So there is that business management function. So across all this, there is a talent. And I think we are trying to solve it, but there's a lot more to be done. Uh, that's very heartening to hear. Mm. Shilpa? Yeah, even coming to you, if you can talk about, uh, you know, many enterprises still use legacy firewalls. They're not effective. So if you can take us through what is the future of firewalls? How is uh, software addressing that? 
I think that uh, in general, uh, organizations uh, staying away or trying or start, starting to shift from appliances based approach to something more software based, exactly because of the reason of the operational cost of managing that. Uh, appliances usually require physical connection to a network. And uh, changing that requires someone going there uh, and uh, switching wires. That's uh, something that was not possible in the pandemics. Uh, and uh, in fact, the, the timeline of physical manual effort is not meeting any business requirements anymore. Uh, so we specifically talk about segmentation, uh, which is, by the way, what firewalls were supposed to do is create segments. Uh, just uh, it, it takes too much time. Uh, and uh, especially if you need to do it across a global organization, you need to involve multiple people going to multiple places. Um, it just doesn't fit uh, the modern environment. So it's, we see a lot of organizations uh, starting to think about shifting from this approach to software-based. I think the, the wider adoption is uh, exactly because firewalls were not fit to implement a lot of segments, uh, which is what micro-segmentation is. So micro-segmentation is first taking place where the firewalls created a gap, uh, which is mostly inside the network. Uh, now, the forward-thinking organization is saying, OK, maybe maybe I can stay away from firewalls at all. I can remove them from a data center. So we see. A lot of our customers actually not renewing firewalls uh, and uh, uh, building their organizations and building their networks on based on, on software defined approach. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, this is the future definitely. It will take time because uh, taking a firewall out of organization is a complex process. Technically, it's a complex process because you need to disrupt the network a little bit. Uh, uh, psychologically, is a difficult process because this is the most trusted known uh, security tool in the organization. And on the talent side, it's a process because people build their careers on firewalls. And now uh, what does this mean for them? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's inevitable. Uh, process, uh, in my opinion, because this is, you know, just this is how the cloud, cloud builds. There are no real appliances, so uh, this is definitely a software approach is taking over. Uh, and I do believe that and see that everything that's new is already built in this new manner, uh, and everything that's old will uh, softly but surely uh, shift away from from boxes. Nitesh, so that's the general Akamai Guadi co proposition. Uh, uh, how's that? You've been taking me to the Indian market. How's that resonating? Yes. Um, so this is new. And as uh, Errol mentioned, uh, we do have uh, you know a few existing customers in India who are already using Guadi Core. Uh, but before that, uh, let me uh, let me just also give you a quick sort of snapshot on what have we been up to uh, with respect to uh, you know security and helping our customers in India. So over the last several years, uh, we have grown our security portfolio from you know point solutions into a comprehensive platform, which, as I mentioned earlier, provides defense in depth to address some of the biggest uh, cybersecurity threats. Now, the breadth of our uh, defenses is important to a lot of our customers in India and across the globe who want more security capabilities from fewer vendors. Uh, our security solutions are highly differentiated and recognized as best in class by our customers who see us as a leading provider of services that protect most of their critical assets, including enterprise websites, applications, data, access, um, you know, for example, Akamai disrupted the web application security market when we launched uh, our product called Kona Site Defender back in 2012. And since then, we have continued to extend our leadership position in the uh, web application firewall space. Uh, we've been the market leader in uh, DDoS protection since we acquired Prolexic back in 2014. Um, and as uh, new threat vectors have emerged, we've extended our platform to really defend against them. 
We also created the uh, first comprehensive uh, bot management solution to protect our customers from um, you know, sophisticated bot operators who try to steal content, disrupt operations, or uh, you know, penetrate user accounts. Uh, most recently, we released uh, Akamai uh, uh, Page Integrity Manager to really identify malicious code in uh, third-party scripts and uh, websites that are designed to steal uh, you know, end-user data. Uh, this really helps to address a major threat that's been costing businesses hundreds of millions of dollars and fines, as well as uh, serious reputation damage. Uh, we now plan to extend our web application uh, protections further uh, with solutions like Account Protector, primarily for audience hijacking prevention. Now, this is designed to reduce frauds by uh, you know, making sure that the entity logging into an account is really the true owner of that account. Uh, audience hijacking prevention, of course, can help businesses protect sales by efficiently navigating malware that diverts a customer just before the completion of a transaction. So, you know, really since our founding 20 years ago, our vision has been to help our customers solve their toughest uh, internet challenges. And now, of course, that includes uh, stopping ransomware. We're already selling solutions like enterprise application access that help prevent attackers from gaining access to an enterprise infrastructure and applications. But to be secure in uh, you know, today's world, uh, organizations also need a second layer of defense to block the spread of uh, malware that has gained into uh, you know foothold into an enterprise, and that's where Guardigo comes in. It helps detect you know when a breach has occurred by uh, identifying anomalous data flows within the enterprise network. Um, Guardigo also helps prevent the malware from spreading through a capability which uh, you know Ariel earlier touched upon, known as micro segmentation where the solution limits access within the enterprise to only those applications that are authorized to communicate with each other. Uh, you know, den denying communications as a default greatly limits the uh, spread of malware and protects the flow of enterprise data across the network. And that's the key to stopping uh, ransomware. And we truly believe, you know, Guardicore's best-in-class micro-segmentation solution is the uh, perfect addition to our zero trust portfolio, enabling uh, Akamai to offer customers a comprehensive solution to stop the damage being caused by uh, ransomware and, and malware. Okay, got it, yeah. Uh, there's this is question from uh, Manish Rao uh, from the audience uh, uh, asking, oh, Rama, maybe you can take that uh, on cybersecurity insurance. What is your view? Are, are companies taking it? Of course. I mean, I think now cyber insurance is reasonably a mature, uh, you know, practice. Uh -huh. At least all the large enterprises, uh, it's, it's over a period of time, right? I mean, there was very low understanding of cyber insurance, even from an actuary side, you know, how do you assess the risk? What would be the role of uh, risk assessment when you uh, structure a policy, particularly post that, you know, will the cyber insurer provide you in terms of, you know, the entire remediation, uh, you know, investigation also. So whereas now I think increasingly, at least across all the large enterprises, the cyber, uh, it's part of the CROs and CISO starter. And there is a lot more maturity in the insurance provider ecosystem. I think even organizations like IRDA have given some attention to it on how do you go about these kind of policies. But still, I don't think it's broadly taken by all small and medium businesses and several other businesses, I don't think. Whereas if you look at all the large enterprises, the CISOs very much take it. It's very similar to the way you protect a lot of your information assets, right? Uh, cyber insurance is one of the risk mitigation strategy particularly with the ransomware attacks rising, cyber insurance is uh, gaining a lot of attention. And sometimes that's part of the assessment of the providers also by the customer organizations on how are they uh, insured and all of that. But we still have a long way to go, both on the provider side and the structuring the policies, because the policy should be uh, linked very closely to what is the digital risk quotient of the enterprise for which the policy is rolled out. I think what are the frameworks to measure the digital risk 
quotient of an enterprise is not an easy thing with the way the digitization is you know leapfrogging every quarter how do you continuously assess the digital risk of an enterprise what workloads are they moving to the cloud what is happening remotely what is the integration with third party suppliers third party vendors i think how do you continuously evaluate this is a big challenge but taking cyber insurance at least in all the large size enterprises across verticals is one of the it's become now like a hygiene fact um yeah okay okay i'm sure it's complex though yeah shilpa yeah we have a question from our audience shiladitya saha to compliances and laws of the land about maintaining data servers within the country cause a deterrent to cyber security Right. Mm -hmm. You do want to take it? Yeah, yeah. I can take that. I think the before we get into the cyber security aspects, overall uh, mandates and regulations around data residency tend to impact the digitization momentum, because I think where the data resides is not so important. It's extremely important on how are you making sure that you're securing your data and you're doing the privacy protection. It's only a myth that. Uh, data residency within a country will guarantee privacy i beg to differ on that i have actually done a dissent note when i was part of the committee of sri krishna justice sri krishna's committee even our recent naspom uh, submission to joint parliamentary committee mandated that right so it does challenge that the moment when you talk about data residency in a particular geography which means you're putting the onus of uh, you're not Uh, you know the kind of security best practices that you can do around your data centers it it gets diluted to a certain extent i am not saying data residency in a certain geography will make it more insecure but it does not also uh, guarantee more security right because when you look at the uh, data center industry and now the cloud industry worldwide where the data centers reside it's a very complex thing right from quality of power to uh you know the talent pool that is available to manage the data center so i would say that residency of data in a certain geography does not guarantee either security or privacy okay okay uh, there is also this question on uh, maybe ariel can take that uh, you know metaverse is uh, how does uh, does that impact security quant also quantum computers and all that metaverse first yeah it's a interesting question uh not an expert in this at all uh frankly but uh i think that uh it's uh it's frankly yet to be seen i think that uh it's uh uh in my opinion a lot of hype and not a lot of implementation yet Okay. Uh, we'll see how this develops, and but I'm sure any innovation will bring uh, new risks. So uh, uh, that, that's the only thing I have. Uh, in what, mind. What, what about okay. quantum aerial? Quantum Sorry? computers, I'm I'm told, will have a deep impact on secure security practices. I think the. I think it it's even further than uh, metaverse, in, in my okay. opinion. Okay. Okay. It's a while away. Not, Okay. But if it happens, it can have implications on uh, strengths of uh, uh, cryptography that is the underlying feature in security, and then in your risks can can appear where something you th thought is strong and secure and can only be uh, brute forced in uh, three billion years. Uh, this can break and and if this breaks uh, with quantum computing that that can affect a lot of practices uh, but i think it's it's really really nothing uh, still okay okay so i also want to ask you micro segmentation does that use ai a lot uh it does yeah i think uh almost any security product today uh uses ai just to deal with complexity in micro segmentation specifically the whole notion of understanding your data center helping you decide how to build the micro segments uh is basically built on machine learning algorithms that help you identify applications look at your data center saying hey this is your 
uh, these are your web applications, this is your uh, these are your databases, this is where critical information is. This is the best practice of how to sit mantles uh, and uh, share this knowledge from between customers and uh, enable you to do this with a few clicks without you know going through the same process again and again in every organization. Okay, okay. Shilpa, do you have anything? If I may add, you yeah. know, like nothing to do with just micro segmentation now. Rama, you sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm saying now AI and ML are core to every security product and also a service because that's the way you're detecting and remediating and you know analyzing the data, machine learning, and there are some with also deep. Rama, you again. They are core to every security stack and product. Okay, okay. Got it. Shilpa, were you, did you have anything? Yes, Sujit. I have this question from uh, Surya Nischal. How can enterprises take care of, uh, take care of accounts uh, for slip-ups from their end customers? Who wants to take that? Mitesh? Yeah, so I uh, obviously need to qualify this question better. So I really didn't get the account slip-ups. Is it more around, uh, there's a question more on account takeovers? Maybe, Shilpa, you're muted. Uh, is it? No, how can yeah. enterprises take care to account for slip-ups from their end customers, you know? If I'm... If I can read from the question, I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, I think it is, you know, Mitesh, what they're saying is your end consumer security awareness. Yeah. Let's say you're a bank. How can a bank take care of the lack of security awareness of their end consumers? Probably that's the question. Right. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a continuous process. And I think uh, from our standpoint, uh, you know, both the enterprises and, uh, and it's a continuous journey, you know, and the end customers need to uh, continuously be educated about the risks and, uh, uh, you know, how can uh, they sort of protect themselves uh, by, uh, you know, having, uh, by being aware of uh, some of the threats that we see on a daily basis. Okay, so we are almost out of time. Uh, some final words from each of you. Um, Mitesh, you want to start a message to companies and to users in general? What would that be? Yeah, sure. And I'll uh, I'll probably uh, you know touch up on Akamai first. So you know, obviously, uh, customers our customers see Akamai as uh, as a strategic partner. Um, in security, not only because of the strength and breadth of our solutions, but also because of the uh, depth of our uh, security expertise and uh, threat intelligence and the scale of our platform. Um, you know, it's the same platform that underpins uh, our world's leading CDN, uh, where we handle five trillion requests every day. In addition, resolve uh, you know more than three trillion DNS queries each day, which sort of gives us unmatched you know, real-time insight into world's internet traffic, which we then analyze to provide best-in-class threat uh, intelligence protection and uh, and support. And, you know, we also touched upon uh, the cybersecurity skills or the shortage of it. Uh, but at Alchemy, we have one of the industry's largest and most experienced team of security professionals with uh, thousands of engineers and consultants uh, working on security for our customers. Um, so I uh, definitely, uh, you know, welcome uh, anybody to come and talk to our team and uh, probably learn and understand more about uh, what we have to offer uh, to protect the enterprises. And we're really, really looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, the, the joint forces with, uh, with Guardi for now. Ariel, any final words? Yeah, I, I just want to advocate Zero Trust as a, as a, I really believe in this framework. I think organizations facing change in their IT and the way their business works, uh, this is a really good framework to adopt uh, uh, and follow. Uh, so uh, uh, any, any organization that has substantial IT should uh, look at this. And uh, I believe Akamai has uh, a lot of advice to give and a lot of tools to provide for, for dealing with that. 
Okay, Rama. I would say security is a collective and shared responsibility. So it is not just the uh, role of the security providers and the industry members like Akamai and their peer organizations, but there's a role for government and national security institution for the user enterprises and most importantly, even end users who are going digital and going online. And all of us need to collectively make sure that we step up. up. Absolutely. So uh, it's everybody's responsibility while we have some fantastic technologies. Uh, uh, I mean, as users, we can be the loose ends which can create trouble. So uh, thanks so much to all of you, Mitesh, Rama, Ariel. Really nice having you on the platform. Uh, great discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Ajay. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.